This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host. Hello, everyone. This is the Physical Activity Researcher podcast, and I am Nora Ronkainen. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. The ongoing COVID-19 lockdowns around the world have disrupted many people's sport, exercise and physical activity habits. While runners might have been able to continue running, and many people have done various home exercises, martial artists might be one group of physical activity participants who find it more difficult to continue practicing martial arts. They don't have access to their community and their shared practices. And in many martial arts, sparring partners are an essential part of the practice too. Today's guest is conducting case studies in three different British martial arts environments. Wing Chun Kung Fu, Tai Chi, and an Academy of Historical European Martial Arts, HEMA, to understand how they have adapted their pedagogies to the changes brought by the COVID-19. He is a lecturer in sports sociology and physical culture at Cardiff Metropolitan University, a qualitative researcher and a sociologist of sport interested in alternative physical cultures and in particular traditional martial arts and folk games. Let's welcome George Jennings. Oh, hello. Th- thanks, Nora. Thanks for the kind introduction. Yeah, wonderful to have you in the show today. That's nice to be here. Um, just first of all, uh, kind of as a curiosity. So I just wanted to share an observation that I think I've met quite a few sports psychology scho- uh, scholars and practitioners who don't really do any sports themselves. But I can't really think of anyone who is a martial arts scholar and who doesn't do any martial arts themselves. <laughs> so I'm I'm curious whether these people exist. Yeah, yes. Very good question. Really good. Have me thinking. Um, I would agree that yeah, predominantly people who research martial arts are martial artists. And it comes from the field being recently established, I think, from a from passion. You know, it's been a, it's many ways it's a labor of love doing doing martial arts research. Um, I remember reading one book review of um, Ben Jenkins's text. Um, the creation of Wing Chun. Now, Doug, Doug Weil, who's a Tai Chi scholar, and of course he writes about Tai Chi, he reviewed this book and he said, well, the, this text is a labor of love. And he said, it explains that, you know, if you love Wing Chun or you love martial arts, you write about this in, in depth. And he explained, he put he positioned uh, martial arts studies in relation to, for example, feminism, or where did feminism develop from, wasn't or women's studies, for example. Well, it was largely developed by women, yeah, or uh-huh. African-American studies or Latino studies developed by um, African-Americans or Latinos. So generally, the people who are fascinated or have the experience of the subjectivities that drive this form of knowledge or the or pursuit of knowledge are the ones who do the research. So you generally find that, yeah, the, the, I tend to use the, the term practitioner researcher, that we're both practitioners and researchers, and, and a lot of our practice drives what we look at. And also in, in martial arts studies or martial arts research, People tend to have their own kind of niche area or, or, or line of investigation on a particular type of martial art. So I mentioned Douglas Weil in, in Tai Chi, uh, Ben Jokin, some Chinese martial arts, and some others look at, for example, European martial arts, historical European martial arts, and they are practitioners of those particular fighting systems. Um, yeah, so uh-huh. we, uh, and I've heard, I also heard the term pracademics, which is one colleague, uh, Anastasia, she mentioned that, um, you know, the idea of you're, you're a practitioner or, and an academic, so you're blending the two. Um, and you you can never separate the two really. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's really, really interesting. So, uh, what is your own relationship with martial arts? Okay, well, I started as practitioner first, like most. And again, th- th- there's a dynamic there because some people might be a um, an academic who gets into martial arts and then does research, which is le- less common. But most of us, and I'm one of those. I was done the practice first. I started when I was 14. I started in Taekwondo because my, my best friend, closest friend, he he, studied, he was a practitioner of Taekwondo since he was a little kid. 
and I followed, thought, oh, I'll, I'll give that a go. And I really got into it, enjoyed the, the training, the physical training, and also the aspects of different cultures and philosophies. And then I learned more about Bruce Lee, and I got into Wing Chun through Bruce Lee, because I knew that he did that when he was younger. And I, I uh-huh. carried on, and I tried a few others, like Kendo, and I tried um, um, Judo as well. And, and I moved on, and I started to become a researcher later when I um, was studying in my first degree, my sports science degree, exercise and sports sciences at Exeter. And there they had a, a qualitative research unit. So the qualitative research unit specialized, of course, in qualitative research, narrative and life histories and, and ethnography. And I conducted an ethnography of my own Kung Fu school and to understand it as a subculture. And that's where I kicked off really at the end of my undergraduate degree. Um, and I'd read one book that the summer before my third year, which was um, Philip Zirilli's monograph, When the Body Becomes All Eyes. So this is an ethnographic monograph where Philip Zirilli, who's a theater, comes from a theater background, really, but he conducted his own ethnographic study in southern India on the Indian martial art of Kalari Payat. Uh, and this fascinated me that you could actually write, go into de- in depth into the culture, the history, the philosophy, the practices, all, all these dynamics of a martial art and, and go in depth with that. And that's when I wanted. Hmm. I thought I want to be a researcher. And I think my supervisor's like, okay, take it, take it one step at a time. But funnily enough, now we're we're co- close colleagues at work. So, <laughs> so I, I was lucky <laughs> to follow that dream. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. Uh, so you first started practicing martial arts yourself, and now you have started theorizing, researching, conceptualizing some of some of those things that are going on. So. Can you just tell us a little bit about what is fascinating about mm. martial arts yeah. in terms of your own practice and, and also when you look at it from an, uh, more a researcher perspective? So what yes. what's there that is attracting you? Yeah, it's, it, it, I think there's so many things. I almost say that martial arts can be related to, to anything. So you could think about martial arts, like the, we're going to talk obviously later about the COVID. So you could look at linked to how martial arts can be interrupted or the practice or how martial arts are transmitted and taught. So I'm interested in pedagogy as well. Um, also, the body is central, as we know, in martial arts, and it could be the body, you know, the intersubjective connection between bodies, um, or it could be your own internal perception of the body. So every martial art is slightly different to that emphasis, and I think this is the great diversity that martial arts offer. So you might have a weapons-based martial art like kendo, or predominantly weapons-based like like HEMA, historical European martial arts, or you may have the close range with a grappling element of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Or a Wing Chun, you know, sensitivity training, developing the body awareness. So I find that the, with the diversity of martial arts practices, there are potential for human transformation and cultivation. So I, I was always interested in you know, that element of cultivation, transformation. But overall, I would say I'm very interested in in the concept of reinvention. Uh, that, that means in the sense of reinventing the person, how you can become perhaps a, a different person through the martial arts, and also how martial arts themselves are being reinvented or harnessed. For different purposes, so there's like they're being reconstructed in that sense, perhaps for as therapies, as forms of self-help, uh, as perhaps a way of reinstating national pride. So martial arts are being used in many different purposes. So that's why I've started to look at it more recently in, in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and we'll talk about that a little bit yeah. later in the episode today. Yeah. Uh, I think the first thing that would be interesting to talk about this is the COVID situation that is something that is affecting everyone's lives at the moment. And before we're going to talk about your ongoing research, maybe you can just share your personal experience of your own martial art practices and, and, and the disruption. So how how has this time been for you and for your martial art practices? Yes, um, it's unexpected because I'd already started some ethnographies or two ethnographies. One of Tai Chi Chuan um, and other related internal martial arts, Chinese martial arts um, in Wales, and also historical European martial arts. So I, I, I started those as, as obviously deliberate projects. So I became a practitioner of those arts for the research, although I do obviously enjoy them. But my main martial art still is Wing Chun. So I, I normally train Wing Chun with my friend, who's also called George. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I joke, we're both English expats living in Wales. <laughs> that he lives in another <laughs> town. But when he comes to Cardiff, we train together. He has, he's very kind to, to come around. We usually train you know, once a week. But I also train at home. So, and we often go to the seminar or, or old teacher in, in England when we can several times a year. Um, so that's the my, my, you know, the base of my martial arts. Although I do train a lot of Tai Chi these days, and my personal training, I'm um, see, Hema. 
So I didn't, uh-huh. you know, it came to a bit of a surprise, but I knew that, you know, it, as it spread from China to the UK, it may, it may eventually we have to stop. Um, first of all, the Tai Chi school closed that, that week where things were starting to be of a concern. And then my HEMA instructor, he tried to push it until the, the, the extreme, in fact, he pushed it to the as extreme as you can go in, in the lockdown in the UK, two hours before the total official lockdown, you're still training with a small group of people. <laughs> so he's very uh-huh. hardcore to, to the end. Um, and then we, they started to adapt. And I was starting to think, how are they adapting? Because I am interested also in um, the pragmatics of pedagogy and, and how people are being creative as martial arts are arts. And we're always adapting to the scenario. And this sort of aspects of chaos, really, as martial arts deal with. If it's not in combat or war, it's also in life. So I started to think, oh, I, I can turn this ethnography or these ethnographies into um, an interesting case study of what people are doing. Which I think that it's mm-hmm. really, really worthwhile listening to what they're doing, reading what they're doing, because it's, you know, they're very being very innovative. And generally, it's, I'm interested also in the, the sense of community. Although we're individual practitioners, we're, like you mentioned the community of practice. I mean, definitely that they're, they're, they're practicing in virtually or they're doing things socially together as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what you already said about being a practitioner or martial artist yourself and, and a researcher at the same time. So kind of your, I asked about your personal experiences and then we actually end up talking about the research context as well. So yeah. they cannot be like fully separated at all. No, uh, no, it's, it's hard. So, it's, sorry. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, so it's 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 quite interesting. So the project had been ongoing already before, mm-hmm. uh, or you started before before the lockdowns, and then you actually were able to witness what happens before and after. So yeah, so I'm I'm sure that's one of the strengths of the study that you were there right at the moment when things started unfolding. Yeah, I, I've been um, the study itself has been running for about a year and a half. So I started um, in the autumn of 2018. As again, entered a street as a beginner, started to learn the martial arts, and now I'm you know a regular member. Really, I go several times a week. So HEMA, the classes are twice a week, and sometimes we have events at the weekend or maybe a, 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 a grading every few months or a sparring event. And then the Tai Chi is also twice a week, with again with some weekend courses or workshops. So I'm, you know, a familiar face in the classes, and I try to get involved in social activities. Um, and then it was just, you know, unexpected that this had happened. But I thought, well, I'm not going to stop my my research, and I thought or I already was interested in the online aspect because all, all martial arts groups, nearly well, nearly all, will have a website. They probably have a Facebook group. They may have a YouTube channel, or the, or some of their practitioners will. They may have a blog or a podcast. And it's something I perhaps I actually almost neglected a little bit because I was always focused on the the participation my traditional field notes and then starting to conduct in face-to-face interviews and then now i've got you know i've got all this wealth of online digital material I, i'm delving into um many because of the, the lockdown which mm-hmm. is good it's something i think after the lockdown i still continue to use that a lot more and balance my research a lot more with the digital and the physical uh-huh yeah yeah and as a researcher practitioner and and as a qualitative researcher Uh, well, I I prefer to talk to people face to face and 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 being physically involved in the training space and observing and and you're an ethnographer, so that's that's what you do. So, how how did you feel as a researcher now being reliant on these online resources and kind of losing these other sensory dimensions of 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 mm. the environment and and your research context? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I think I wasn't as um, surprisingly. I wasn't too worried about that because I think I, I quite like the, the ability to step back and train on your own for a while. I think it's good to have those mm-hmm. kind of periods, and not too long, obviously. You don't want like years on your own, but I've had that because I've uh, moved around a lot for, for work, different circumstances. So I have in Wing Chun, for example, I, I was away from my teacher for several years, and I actually taught myself, or I trained a lot at home, but I didn't mm-hmm. have a regular class. So I, I'm used to have, or I have private students, for example. So I'm I'm used to having that isolation and reflection to look inside your own body to, for example, your posture, your alignment, your, perhaps the you know, relaxation, and I'm quite like I still I still do that type of research, and um, that links to earlier projects. So I've collaborated with some colleagues, um, with such as Jacqueline Allen Collinson's team, the Health Advance, uh, Advancement Research Team based in Lincoln. So I'm an associate researcher there. So that's that more phenomenological research. So I, I'm interested in you know the, the, the senses and for example, the sense of heat and how it's utilized in martial arts, particularly in the Chinese martial arts. 
So, mm-hmm. but that, but then again, I was, I find it's interesting because the, the groups have adapted. I mean, I, the, for example, the Tai Chi group and quite soon into the, the lockdown started to use Zoom, for example. So that, that group, it, we're not, we were just doing the Tai Chi with a form, the basic exercises. We obviously can't do the partner work, but we are focusing on what my teacher calls like reverse engineering, breaking down into the small components and you know, all the things we think we know, we, we realize we don't know. And I find that's really useful. He's, and he's recording the classes as well. So in many ways, the tuition has been enhanced. I mean, some of the, the students recently gave feedback that they think that they've learned more in the last three months than in an entire year because he's, he's, he's uh, developed shorter videos of particular exercises and set, share them with us for us to practice. And then there's a reflection. And there's, it's really good pedagogy, actually. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. And the HEMA is also now, we now all, also have physical training sessions once a week where we're learning... Um, for example, dagger or sword, and we were trying to in limited space, and that's an aspect of how we how can we train it in limited space, which helps you train at home and reinforces that as well. Yeah, hmm. so I think there's still a physical training, but obviously we can't fight each other. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think that's really a positive message from from what you're finding in your research that actually mm. some people are finding that they are learning more, and and so kind of the change the way you practice can actually have some maybe unexpected positive benefit, uh, benefits as well. Yes. Yeah, so I yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's really exciting to find out. Um so maybe if you talk a little bit about your initial findings in three in these three communities that you've studied. So what are the similarities, what are the differences mm. in in what they are doing and and do you have some insights in terms of what seems to be working in adapting and, and what might not be working? Okay. Yeah, so maybe I go one by one, just and then we could try to get an overall connection between the three. So, for example, the mm-hmm. Wing Chun group um, which is run by – is almost a full-time gym, really. My teacher, he's a yeah, full-time Sifu or, or, or teacher in Wing Chun and other, other Chinese martial arts. And this academy has a physical space, its own designated space, which was a, a converted ch- chapel. So obviously that was closed. The gates are closed. You, can't, you couldn't go in there. And he was thinking of developing an online teaching uh, session, which he could lecture about Wing Chun. Because Wing Chun has a, a lot of theory, um, about you know, biomechanical theory or technical theory. And each, um, each school or branch or lineage, we say, has its own interpretation of the, the, you know, the rules and the principles of the system. So he... Like his his teacher, who also likes to lecture quite extensively, uh, was able to do that. So we, we used um, the Facebook Messenger app, which they often use. That Facebook seems to be their medium for communication, um, and we started to have a split screen. So it was maybe as a few, you know six of us or five of us or a few of us, and we were able to see each other. And he could then use his phone. So he used his phone rather than a, a laptop typically so which is more portable so he started to show okay here's my technique and he would sit down me sitting on a chair he would show the hand technique and adjust the phone sometimes he'd put the phone on perhaps towards the floor in the corner of the room and show footwork and explain some of the stepping techniques and, and often we would do things at the same time so he's okay let's do the eight punches so a drill what we do in our particular lineage or the eight stances or the eight elbows and we would do that together but other times he would use things, um, perhaps um, things like a magnifying glass and uh, some, uh, remote control he put together to show this kind of the arc or trajectories of, of punches. And he used anything he could find, like even two oranges, I think, were once used <laughs> under his arms to show some principles. So basically, he used anything he find. He, he typically recorded from the kitchen. So he'd find things in the kitchen and he'd explain things with that. And, we'd, and he'd ask us to take notes. And all of us were you know, writing notes. Obviously, I was doing notes for two things, technically and also looking at the pedagogy. So that was interesting. Uh-huh. He, kept, he kept that up. And he actually, at the beginning, he doesn't, although he's quite articulate face-to-face, he's very good with face-to-face with people, he doesn't, he's not so confident uh, being recorded um, on, and being and speaking with a microphone. So at the beginning, he was struggling, to be honest with you. He admitted that. But over mm-hmm. the months, over the weeks, he started to show more confidence and he, he had less technical issues. He could master, he knew when, how to you know, use the most, maximize his data and, and broadband and positioning, and there are very, very few glitches, and it works very smoothly towards the end. And he now feels that he would actually be able to offer online tuition at a distance to George and I. So we, me and George, so we're obviously living in you know, 200 miles away. We can't get to him that often. So he would often, perhaps we could get together 
in you know my place or his place, then we we be able to get a private lesson <laughs> online on maybe some of the forms, the finer aspects of of the system. So that's yeah, something so, really quite encouraging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that could be one of the longer term changes or hmm. you can have these kind of ways of practicing also in in the future when hopefully the situation is is different and, yeah, and we can train in the gym space yeah. and, and yeah. Yeah, exactly. Wow. And I can go to would you like mm-hmm. me to, I could tell about the other two schools. So the the, the Tai Chi school um continued with just Tai Chi because they also do something called Nei Gong. So Nei Gong is a bit like Qigong, but it's a system um, kind of spiritual development, health development based on kind of Taoist cosmology. Um, and normally in this class, it can be a bit dangerous because the stances are very difficult and people sometimes, because of the transformative process, perhaps go to the floor, they go with what they see as the energy taking them to the ground. And, and so he said, for safety reasons, we're not doing that. We're just going to do Tai Chi. So we did uh-huh. the, the, um, the Tai Chi just an hour and a half, twice a week. And it worked really well. And, and typically, just like the real classes, it's often people hang around with a teacher. I'm sure it's the same in your martial arts group and, and maybe 10, 15 or 20 minutes after the, outside the hall where we train. Well, here we, we do mm-hmm. it virtually. So we have the, the, the good class, the quality class where we get, get to take some notes. We listen. Sometimes he lectures for a few, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But a lot of it's physical training, a lot of repetition, a lot of drilling, forcing us to repeat or hold postures, which is really good to keep the, uphold the discipline. And, and of course, mm-hmm. he's doing recording. He records us as well to check. I mean, he sometimes asks us to repeat so he can monitor us again. And, and he, he teaches from his conservatory, so a space where we can see almost everything. And we use props as well. He said, like, for example, oh, I've got to, um, you know, keep your head up and you're, you, you're raising from the crown point to the back of the skull. And you put something on the, on top of your head. So I, I use a clothes peg, for example. <laughs> and I sometimes I forgot <laughs> and it fell off to the ground a few times. So it shows really that you're not quite keeping the, the correct alignment. So again, we're ma- he's maximizing all the things we have at home, which you normally wouldn't have. So you could use a chair or, or I use maybe the fireplace to put my hand just for balance for some exercises. So uh-huh. that's good. Because in the big hall, we don't always have that because we use a big space with not m- much equipment. Whereas here in home, you could, you have many things to use. Uh, and that links to the, he- the HEMA group. Um, for example, they started off without any physical training. Interesting, despite being very physical, there's a very physical martial art. They they kept up the sociability because normally we have a you know, now and again we go for ice cream or pancakes after training, <laughs> and undo the good work we've done, <laughs> and have a laugh and sometimes at the pub, but normally just to have some to eat for an hour or so and chat. But now we couldn't mm-hmm. do that, so we had a film night, which they some of them already do that as friends anyway, because my um, my instructor and his wife who assists in the class they uh, had been um, separated by ge- geography before when she was working elsewhere in another country. So what mm-hmm. she told me that once they watched um, films online through Zoom or Skype and they press play at the same time, say on Netflix. So we did that actually with our group. So we we go on Netflix together and we say, okay, let, we're watching this film this week, and then we press play with three, two, one, play, and then we we mute our microphones watch the film and then we unmute when we make a joke so basically we select bad films what we say <laughs> a lot of action <laughs> films and we just make fun of how bad the plot is or how you know the acting is terrible or, or you know how they're doing things incorrectly especially if swords are involved so that's how it uh-huh. started off and then then it got into the physical training on on fridays which we, on the day we normally train to keep up the routine which the wing chun group always also did uh, and I was quite lucky actually that the each day, day was slightly different. So my diary worked out that I could do the 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 um, film night on Wednesday and the physical training on Friday, but also do Saturday morning class for Tai Chi and a Tuesday for Tai Chi. And just as the Tai Chi class finished, I can go to my Wing Chun, and then the Thursday night was another Wing Chun. So I I was very lucky that these these groups train on different days, <laughs> so I could actually get involved all three. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah. So it started off an hour, an hour and a half, just. Fairly light training, bit of a walk. We couldn't do the usual warm up because we do train in a l- big, uh, big sports hall normally. So we do lots of running the circuits around that to warm up. We couldn't do that in our patios or gardens because, and some people live in a, a flat, for example, so they can't even run outside. So mm. we did think of jogging on the spot or jumping up and down on the spot. Um, and and then one of the students um, who's a also a stunt man or a budding stunt man who does lots of physical training like gymnastics and fitness. He has noted a drop in his fitness and he had offered us through the, again, the messenger group we have, you know, could, would you like be interested in, in a circuit training session or a hit workout, the high intensity interval training workout? And we we're like, okay, we'll give it a go. Although a lot of um, the group are perhaps less um, athletic than him, to be honest. I mean, there's, there's interesting diversity in the group. Uh, 
some are more interested in the history and almost a, also fantasy and, and board games and those things, and, and some are more into martial arts and uh, athletics. So we, we do that directly after the Friday class. And uh-huh. more recently, they've been interested in meditation as well, because some of them, I think some of the students have approached the teacher saying, oh, we feel, you know, the well-being and you know, they're, they're worried about their well-being and mental health. So we started it. We started it last week. We've got another one on, on now on Tuesday. So now the Wing Chun has finished for me online because they're in England and they can now start to reopen their activities at a distance. I, we have oh. got another activity for HEMA, which is meditation which my partner she's a, a mindfulness researcher and, and an instructor so she's they asked if she could do it so again it's not just the instructor delivering things but it's the part of the wider community so it's one of the, the senior students doing something and another one of the senior students who runs the website he also running dungeons and dragons board game night which on, on, uh-huh. on sunday so that's something i'm going to get involved in next to, to learn more about that so I'm not really a tabletop gamer, but I think it's important for me to understand that part of the of the subculture in many ways, of their yeah. fantasy world and exploration. So yeah, yes, yeah, so all of them are developed. It's not just the teacher, the hierarchy. As many people might st- externally think of martial arts as a very hierarchical, kind of patriarchal system where there's one teacher, one sensei, you know, who's in control. But we start to see here that there's a community of practice where someone's really good with technology or, or tech and this guy who runs the website he's that's his job really and he's even got his little command center at home he's got three big screens and he operates he sets up all the zoom chats for us and and without right. those people we wouldn't have that success to be honest with you so yeah, yeah. That's what I so think. yeah mm, so if we think about that you said about martial arts as kind of traditionally there's an image that it's very very hierarchical mm. do you think that the covid lockdown and and what you are finding could that be kind of one one process that that is going on that there might be this kind of disruption of of, of the hierarchy as well? Potentially, but I think what I found um, even before the the lockdown that the the same people were helping quite a bit. So, for example, in the physical training, the same guy who's doing um, the fitness training with us, he's helped us with takedowns because he does ninjutsu and grappling and other things. Which and, mm. and it's something a bit mis- something that's not it's in the manuscripts in HEMA the historical European martial arts manuscripts that there are takedowns and throws but no one no one, it doesn't say how to fall safely it kind of presumes that you know how to do that so they <laughs> fill the gaps with their knowledge yeah so he's, right. he's bringing his knowledge and we've even had external specialists a friend of mine teacher who's also another martial arts how to roll and he he, he first taught us how to fall safely. So uh-huh. I think they're just continuing w- what they're doing, but perhaps a more f- obvious level now because it's more you know, visible through the technology. Um, so and the mm. same with my other teacher, maybe one of his students, my top Kung Fu teacher is a photographer. So he always helps with seminars, the photos and the studio, and he helps a lot of them help promote the the, the academy or the school. So I think mm. it, it's just been heightened, potentially more obvious through the technology because we have this medium where their help is so obvious that we rely on them sending us messages and the communications. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so hopefully it helps reinforce the well the modern pedagogy of martial arts that no one it's not a uh, one trip and it's very rare to have this one entrepreneur who does everything. You know, it's yes, many mm-hmm. of them are you know small scale entrepreneurs, but also they are struggling businesses in many ways, and they need the community. The community want them to continue. So the teachers, the students, really care about their teacher, and they want them to to do well and and to have a living. So that's what they're doing. Really, I think they want all three of these people actually are now almost full-time exclusively. When I first started my studies, um, for example, my HEMA instructor is still working in a, a different business and he started his academy. Now he's being very successful. He's gone to uh-huh. part-time work and he almost exclusively, think eventually wants to become full-time. My Tai Chi teacher was working in a d- design, a kind of a different career, but now he stopped that work and he's now full-time Tai Chi teacher. So again, you know, it's precarious in this scenario. So it's good that they can offer thing courses online. I think, uh-huh. and, and their, their students are helping them with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's good to hear. Mm. And um, if we, it was really interesting to hear about these findings and 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 how these martial arts schools are adapting. So, if you talk about that a little bit from from the research perspective, how are you theorizing mm. and and kind of making sense of of what you are seeing? Yeah, I think broadly speaking, you'd say it's uh, pragmatism might be the philosophy or the paradigm I'm, I'm adapting for this particular study. Um, it's something I was I've been interested in since I read um, Chris Schilling's book Changing Bodies, and I, I, re- I remember reviewing this 
that book for a, for a journal when I was a, finishing my PhD. Um, and I hadn't used it for some years, and only the last few years I got back into it that, um, when I started to develop or try to theorize around the martial arts. And then the other year I wrote in, in the journal Martial Arts Studies an, an article about the uh, Bruce Lee, because there was a special issue on Bruce Lee. And I thought, well, how, what can I talk about with regards to Bruce Lee? Because uh, there lots of things to talk about his films and masculinity in the body, et cetera. And I, I thought, what about him as a founder, how he created his own system or his own philosophy of the martial arts, Jeet Kune Do, uh, the way of the intercepting fist. And I started to use, again, case studies. I found them very useful to build theory. So I, I've used that in that article with, with um, Bartitsu, which is another kind of historical European martial arts, and Shilam, which is a Mexican martial art that I've done some research on. And I use these three case studies to look at I created the theory of martial creation. So the theory of martial creation is how people, how and why, what are the circumstances that drive someone to create their own martial arts or develop a new martial art. So that's, mm-hmm. I started to be interested in started this process of invention, reinvention, creation. And pragmatism, I think, is very useful because one of the key aspects here in pragmatism is the idea of crisis leading to creativity. And we can see here in COVID, we can start use the same kind of approach that, you know, they were already, they had a habit. For example, the first stages, they have habits and ways, pre-designed ways of doing things. They have, people have roles, responsibilities. Here comes a crisis. Okay, they don't react, always react immediately, but they have, upon reflection, you know, they confer, they have communication with, you know, in good humor. They start to do something and it evolves. Yeah, they trip over the way, there are mistakes made, but eventually it, things start to, to run more smoothly. They've adapted mm-hmm. to the situation, so I'm very interested in how people adapt to this kind of chaotic situation and what the, and the long term learning process. And the article at the moment I'm writing is trying to do it in a chronological order uh, through the case studies of what, how it started, what, how they adapted, what and maybe what they're doing now, and how they how this might what this might mean for the future. Um, mm. Yeah, so pragmatism is a broad philosophy, but also trying to build on the theory I specific theories and perhaps develop maybe very key theory to the martial arts, so not just using a broad view on humanity but what's specific about these groups so it might be about this community practice for example that might be one Mm. of those elements yeah 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 that sounds uh quite similar to kind of at the moment i'm working with these ideas about existential learning and discontinuity so kind of when when our ways of doing and being in the world are disrupted, that's that's kind of opens the gap when we have to make new meaning and oh. find new practices and perhaps it challenges the way we understand ourselves and our world. Oh. So so I think there is kind of the same idea about what the COVID uh, situation kind of what is unique about that that it's not it's not the personal disruption like an athlete has a serious injury and that's a personal disruption but now we are talking about the collective disruption yes so that's really good yeah sorry I'm yeah uh, uh, yeah, yeah go that on. Links to the, the other part of the theory i developed was using um wright mills's idea of the sociological imagination so it's not just mm-hmm. personal but it's also social or collective so yeah you have your personal trouble and social social issues and they, they merge so COVID-19 is a perfect example of that. It's like, yes, all of us have been affected. Maybe your business has to shut, you'll close your doors or you, you have to work from home or perhaps uh, you're, you're worried about uh, you know, cross-contamination or these things. But then you've got the social aspect and the, the economic, the financial, the political, and they come together. And that's where the, the crisis emerges, those two. And then you start to, mm. and then the pedagogy has to adapt. So that, yeah, I, I agree. I'd like to read, if you've written anything or you've got something out coming out, that'd be great. Might have to use it in my yeah. article I'm writing. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we will find some kind of points of connection. Yeah, and I also find it interesting in your research that then people are actually coming together. That what you were saying that that the practitioners or the students are supporting their teachers and trying to keep it going and mm. kind of really coming together and forming these online communities. Yeah. So I think that's a really encouraging message as yeah. well. Yeah, definitely mm. it's amazing even so it's quite funny it's striking that there's some people um in the hema group there's set there's a two they call chapters which are basically branches of the same school in that particular language they use uh and some mm-hmm. of them I, I hadn't really known because i was doing my tai chi on the same night to the where what the new class started to open so that these uh-huh. new beginners are now so fully immersed in the culture and helped by the online thing. they're always almost every day writing in the group they're every every week of the film nights. They're ordering new. They're showing the equipment they're buying. So that's another part of their culture is like becoming a, in part of the subculture is to you know, buy all your your sword, your full kit, and 
But it's funny enough, this, one of the students hadn't even got the T-shirt, but it's, and he's entering an online competition of on cutting drills, so cut, showing all your skills online. And he's already got everything. Uh-huh. It's amazing that they've, they've through the online aspects without even meeting people physically. Uh, and it's quite funny, the other day, my partner and I were going for a walk when we were allowed to go out once a day. And we walked around the block and Sunday I saw, hey, George. And I was like, oh, who's this guy? And I crossed the road, kind of rode out warily, but almost forgot that we had the, um, <laughs> or to be honest, we almost forgot the social distancing. My partner's like, George, oh yeah, sorry. So I stepped back and he was, I know, yeah. I realized, but who's this guy? He's talking to me. Is he from work? Oh, no, I know this guy. He's, a, he's in the group, but I've only seen him virtually. So it's quite funny. Yeah. That, and he was, he agreed that the mindfulness would be important and, so the, this is very funny how these people who've never met in person, but now I feel like we know each other. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that that part and what you said about as well, about some of these things might be uh, going on for for a long time, like mm-hmm. when at some point, hopefully the lockdowns will be a distant memory, but we might still have like, new ways of doing things or or things that we learned during this lockdown that we will take with us yeah i think so for example we, well. yeah yeah sorry because so wing chun for example the lot there's a focus on hand-to-hand you know close quarters thing and the, the, you could say perhaps the weapons are overlooked whereas my teacher now because of the distancing he's deliberately teaching <laughs> literally keeping people uh, you know, we say in english there's an idiom i wouldn't touch them with a barge pole i don't know if you heard of that expression <laughs> it's like you know really keep them really uh, great distance from that person this is just a joke but uh-huh. he's literally doing that with his students because he's teaching them with a long pole which is in many several meters you know over two meters in length so yeah. he's able to keep that social distancing by teaching a weapon in the garden so things he probably wouldn't <laughs> normally have taught because he probably everyone wants to focus on the hand skills don't they or the flashy not flashy but the, the realistic techniques but now he's teaching mm-hmm. more of the weapons so hopefully that continues because people that i think the weapons in wing Chun are generally underused underutilized um mm-hmm. by the instructor yeah 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 how about if we kind of th- uh, think about this in a little bit broader perspective so kind of outside yeah. of martial arts mm. all these other sport and physical activity subcultures are also kind of reconfiguring some of some of the ways of doing things so what do you think from from your research what would be some of the things that you you think could be useful and 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 kind of something that could be promoted to yeah other I think, physical cultures as well. Hmm. I think in terms of say academically and research wise, I think the online meetings, online events are definitely a way to go forward. I mean, I've tried to um, organize events. Before. I have organized a few panels and conferences before. I know it's a big, big job. It's a lot of uh, some of the stress and resources required, and room bookings and catering, and which is good. It's great when people meet. It's amazing to see the energy of the room when people unite. But we start to see, for example, we, you and I are both um, involved in the martial arts research, the, the, the martial arts studies conference, which was going to be in Marseille, but it was online. And I wasn't originally going to be in that conference because of just workload and travel. And but then I, because it's digital, I'm involved now. I was able to get in the last, get involved in the last minute. So I think that's something we, we could think about in research communities, more online digital conferences and meetings than think, do we really need to travel? Do we really need to spend that much money or ask for university for money to cr- come across? And uh, Although, mm-hmm. of course, not saying don't always meet up, but I think there's a, there's a rich potential now for technology of what we can do. And it's something I want to develop with a little uh, a mm-hmm. network I'm trying to develop for research, practitioner researchers. But that, was, and that mm-hmm. could be outside martial arts, could be in sport, physical activity. But that's the research side. And in terms of practice and, and actually, you know, the pragmatics reality is that, well, you know, we now have, we have experience of a pandemic. We have experience of not being able to meet outside your own household or your kind of bubble, depending on the, on the, the laws of the country. Um, so therefore, we've, we're now adapted. So I think that we have online resources. We can watch things. We can watch films together. We can, you can have messenger groups. You can have, you know, share memes and jokes together. You can, you know, and members of the group are specialists and can have play a role in that community. So I think, yeah, definitely, it's encouraged. What I found is encouraging, but it could you could replace the martial arts with a, a rugby club or a, a hockey club or whatever it is, or a runners club, mm. you know. And you might be watching films about runners or a documentary. Let's watch, you know, maybe not such silly films we watch, but you might be watching serious documentary about runners and have a discussion forum about that. Or yeah, you can. Lots of things can happen. I think. Um, Mm. from that maybe they wouldn't have happened because you take things for granted and you can meet up 
And yeah, mm. yeah, I think that's yeah, absolutely. And and I think one of these things that might be a good thing as well is that when you're an injured athlete, like I used to be a runner for mm. several years, yeah. and every time you have an injury, you cannot go to the training, and that was kind of the only thing that you do. Mm. So if you can't run, you can't join. And then you kind of end up being an outsider. Mm. But if we yeah. are developing these other, other kind of aspects of 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 the social life of the training group, mm. like you said about a movie night or whatever it is, that might also help people yeah, to kind of re- stay involved. Yeah, that's a really good, interesting point actually, Nora. Because uh, yeah, by injury and uh, being isolated. Because I remember my colleague, a friend and colleague at work, he's still plays football for the football club, the Cardiff Met, and he's mm. saying that he, how he felt isolated when he's been injured he's even given a, one of the lads the football players a lift and, and was picking him up after training but then uh, mm-hmm. I think he said that other players ignored him so it's amazing isn't it that he's now isolated even though they know who he is and he's giving one of the teammates a lift back home the other yeah. one he felt like out of place um, and I thought that's really for me that sounded really foreign and strange like you know a bit absurd really uh, my experience of the groups in martial arts and it might be because you know a lot of sports teams are are competitive and selective. You've got 11 players in the, foot, in the first squad or 22, you know, in the, in the whole team. Mm. So, but whereas in martial arts, they want more people to join. It's never like, never, normally it's not a cap unless it's really popular class with a small hall. Mm. You know, they want more people yeah. to join and they want people to continue and, and the, the ability level is less important than the, the character of the, of the person. So, and I find that a lot of the groups in HEMA, they had sort of injuries, non-related, it's funny enough, not related to HEMA. Some of them have been doing gardening because they have more time on their hands. They, some of them aren't working. They're doing, you know, moving around heavy pots. So the guy who's running the fitness training hurt his back moving a big uh, flower pot. He said it was really uh-huh. big when he wanted to prove his masculinity, of course. He's, he's, yeah, I did honestly, it's it really heavy. And so he couldn't, um, and then from the couch, he was a coach on the couch, as our teacher said, joked. Like he was telling us what to do from a stationary position. So, okay, you guys do this type of press up and, and others were watching, just encouraging us and um, just being there to monitor the, the technology. For example, the guy who runs the website and the Zoom chats, he couldn't do it himself. So he had an injury, but he was there to mm-hmm. make sure that it was running smoothly for us. Um, yeah. So that's really nice to see. And a lot of them were like, in, you know, doing, say, archery. One guy was into ar- archery as well. He did it for three hours in the morning. So he's fatigued. So he wasn't able to train physically in the evening, but he was there to watch the training, take notes. So that's, yeah. that's really encouraging, I think. Yeah. Mm, that is so it can yeah. help us maybe to create more inclusive mm. spaces as well yeah, yeah definitely inclusivity is a big mm. thing i find in these particular physical cultures and martial arts because most of them unless you're like looking at olympic team or something obviously they're going to be very selective very elitist but the majority mm. of martial arts are grassroots community-based activities not really funded by the government they're very much developed by kind of local entrepreneurs and the people around them that work as a community on their own really and often outside the remit of governing body you know, mm-hmm. and they, they're doing things like HEMA there's no unified governing body Wing Chun there's no unified governing and Tai Chi a lot of them are not don't really believe in the main governing bodies their politics and things like that so they work uh-huh. on their own in many ways yeah right yeah, yeah. okay so I, I think we got a lot of uh, exciting and, and quite encouraging news from, from your research how people are Thank adapting you. Uh, let's then talk a little bit about the other work you're doing as okay. well so you talked about martial arts as therapy and martial arts as self-help. So maybe mm. you can just give us a little overview of, of the other things that you're working on at the moment or what you plan yeah. to do. Yeah, because, um, again, I've been very lucky to have met the interesting people. And it seems that South Wales has a hub of <laughs> interesting, uh, again, entrepreneurs or, or innovators, should we say. And um, one day in the weekend, I was um, my partner and I have a nice weekend in West Wales. And I told her, like, you know, I don't know where to go with my research, what direction I'd like to take. And I said, well, you know, I, I think now I want to look at martial arts therapies. Because I start to think how martial mm-hmm. arts studies as a field is, so, is getting very saturated and developed. And I was thinking, where is my direction? Where is my, not necessarily niche, but pathway I'm taking? And I uh-huh. went, but we went back to the kind of the cottage we were staying. And then I checked my on my iPad and it was an email of a Facebook group saying from a guy called Stephen Thomas, who's a psychotherapist. He said, I'm looking to collaborate with academics looking at psychotherapy and martial arts. And I was like, oh my God, what is this? This is a great quint. This is amazing. It's like, a, it's the universe is helping me or something. <laughs> I know that sounds very spiritual, but it's like, that's a weird coincidence. So I checked, I responded to him immediately and we got in touch. And he, funnily enough, was based in Cardiff and Bristol. So how lucky was I that? that someone interested in martial arts therapies 
and I wanted mm. to work with someone in martial arts therapies, we can start a project. And this project is called Fighting in Spirit, uh, which unifies psychotherapy counseling with martial arts in three specific workshops, usually day workshops, mm. both for counselors and psychotherapists and part of their continued professional development, as well as uh, uh, courses open to the public, such as some of their clients, for example, patients. So we mm. started that project, well, really physically, not formally as a research project, but we've still kind of done it through some um, experimental uh, sessions just to see how it's running, okay? And that's been going for about a year now. And I'm hoping to start a formal project, but it's not nothing um, for you. Know, I haven't gone through the ethics or that stuff, so I haven't collected data, but it's just, I've just been helping um, as a as a teacher, as a, as a participant as well. So I've been a student in one of the groups on, for example, Sistema, one of his mentor in, in therapy, is also as a, in, in Russian Sistema, which is a, a close combat kind of military martial art in many ways. Focus a lot on breath, breath control, and working with emotions, controlling things through the breath as a medium between mind and body. So that's really interesting, some of the physical drills they do. Um, so I started involved in that project, um, and that's led me to think about how martial arts, overall, the narrative of my research, maybe the idea of, the idea of reimagining martial arts for different purposes and reconstructing them. So... Mm -hmm. Therapy is one of those things. Could be psychotherapy, could be physical therapy, and I myself have been interested in that aspect of the, the, the diversity of martial arts and physicality. And mm -hmm. then the self helps come more recently because I've well, during the, again during the lockdown, I had a bit more time to read, and I, I remembered I had uh, some books on martial arts. One of my Tai Chi teachers, he was clearing out his his uh, personal library, and he gave me uh, some books on Wing Chun, uh, knowing I was still kind of interested in that. And one of them is called The Intelligent Warrior. Um, and this is about, again, a self-help book written by a Wing Chun teacher, uh, mm -hmm. taking very kind of Chinese perspective on things, kind of um, you know, holistic with meditation and Qigong. And then there was another book I remember I bought years ago, but I'd never read it, <laughs> from Jeff Thompson called Warrior as well. So both had the term warrior in them. And this was a bit more about you know being physical, being strong, and and controlling your desires and all these kind of things, being disciplined. And it's very, it's a good book as well, very well you know engaging as Jeff Thompson's writing is. And I started to think, mm -hmm. okay, let's look. I could look, at, I could write about this. And now I'm I'm starting to write my first monograph. After you know, it's taken me a while, but because uh, often I I get involved in lots of papers and special issues and conferences, and now yeah. I think I need to settle, get a get a book together, which brings in the last decade or so of research. So um, yeah, so there'll, there'll be a chapter on self help on using those case studies, chapter on therapy, okay. chapter on Mexican martial arts and European martial arts and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and I'm I'm curious, how are you kind of thinking about that coupling of martial arts and self help? Like, mm. if we think of martial arts studies more well, historically, I think there have been like a lot of critiques in. Mm like several decades ago about when martial arts, some of the Eastern martial arts came to West and they became kind of Westernized and, and the sportization process and kind of the philosophical and ethical and kind of the moral component of martial mm. arts kind of disappeared or if not completely disappeared, at least it kind of uh, was not the focus of, that anymore and kind of self-help is often by critical scholars kind of thought as just kind of helping me relieve my stress and be happier and that yes. some of the martial arts scholars would say that that's antithetical to the spirit yeah. of, of martial arts how do you yeah. think about that it's hmm. a good, good question is it, i in this book i want to take i have because it's part of a, a series on um sport in east asia so i have to take an eastern approach in a sense i've got to consider asian martial arts in all of the chapters and I'm, I, mm -hmm. the idea is it's, it's kind of a Western, in inverted commas, response, which includes kind of the Western Europe, America, and Mexico, for example, as a Westernized country, even though it's Latin American. Uh, how they've reacted or been influenced or stimulated by, to some degree, the a Asian martial arts, either physically or, or the mediated versions of those. So in this chapter, you look at self-help books are written by Western or British, and here there are two British martial artists, who mm -hmm. have practiced different Asian martial arts, but also some Western practices, uh -huh. and how they uh, they kind of claim that we, you know, for example, Jeff Thompson claims that we, you know, this is a sometimes they're quite bold claims that how we we're going to survive as a species, and he talks about you know hunter gatherer ideas and you know quite um, I you know perhaps romantic ideas of the warrior, uh, and then the other one is looking at more of a Chinese kind of holistic medical perspective. You've got to be out of balance of your emotions, and so I'm using it. I mean, I, I'm going to. 
start the book saying that this this is not really about sports, even though it's <laughs> and the, the sports been covered quite well in, in martial arts research or sociology history of martial arts philosophy mm. as well. We know from the nineteen eighties or seventies onwards, they start to say what's happening. There's a you know back in Kim in the eighties talking about the East, you know the 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 influence of Westernization and the same in judo. What's happening? It's become too rationalized and weight you know all these weight limits and weighing on the scales and. And yeah, that's been covered. So I would, I would obviously do a review of that literature, but I'm not going to delve into that topic because it's been almost exhausted in that way. I wanted to look right. at things that haven't been talked about on their own. They've been mentioned, but mm-hmm. not on their own. So I wanted to look at self-help because that's, again, something fairly, that's just fairly original, I suppose, but it's been in the sense of the, te- the text, the genre of books. So I wanted to, to look into those. Maybe even some things like podcasts. So I am tempted potentially to look at to channel two chapters from one chapter and looking at a very interesting set series of podcasts by again a western practitioner based he moved from britain to portugal and he's got a very successful podcast and again he's and martial arts yeah they are about transformation of self some 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 say self-cultivation but i'd argue they are shared cultivation something i, I worked on in my phd mm-hmm. is that like you know you work with your teacher you work in this community you work with uh, perhaps your partner your family and, and it's something you develop together so the self-help yeah, it, it is a bit of antithesis. That you, you're, you're right. It's like maybe it's not um, purely self-help. The book in itself is is a dialogue because that book is written by someone for another person, but their knowledge mm-hmm. from that book comes from numerous sources. So it's never just one individual. And it is a, a form of pedagogy, but it's usually a supplement to another form of learning. And typically mm. the people who buy these books probably are martial artists anyway. So this book will supplement what they're learning in their community. So I'd argue that case yeah. really. So, but yeah, I'm going to be critical, but maybe not hypercritical because I might think my work. I'm interested in the the reconstruction in theory in, of, of martial arts in a balanced way. So, or so I know our colleagues I know will be very critical of the because I've talked mm-hmm. to Paul Bowman about this when he interviewed me for his podcast, and, he, and I can see that his view he'd find it very difficult to do that. He wants to do that research, but he he find it very difficult to read the books. Whereas I found uh-huh. I, I could read the books and I find them quite interesting. Sometimes you laugh at some of the claims and you know as you do, but I'm not yeah. going to destroy. I'm not out to like destroy someone's writing or something. I'm, I'm out to just understand and appreciate what what's going on with the martial arts. Um, and I yeah, it can mm. be critical, but I think there are more others. It depends on your your kind of paradigm or perspective on the martial arts because I'm interested in more interpreting, understanding, exploring. It's more exploratory rather than deconstructing. Uh, for a post-structuralist lens or a um, Marxist lens, for example. Yeah, yeah, and and I think like whatever we think about self-help and martial arts ourselves, I think it's really interesting to see that that's one of the popular discourses that is probably emerging. Uh, uh, just thinking of my, uh, I lived in Shanghai as a part of my mm. first postdoc, and and I was just looking at where can I go and train. Mm train Thai boxing for example and I was looking at some of the expat forums for example Mm. like where do you have a gym and and like boxing classes they were kind of classified under the Mm. self-help ads and and I thought that was quite interesting that you can do boxing as as self-help like getting punched in the face is kind (laughs) of (laughs) (laughs) the best way of reducing stress and feel happy so that was (laughs) (laughs) I just found it kind of a funny idea yeah it is funny yeah. it's how they catalyze martial arts sometimes it's very you know it's an individual sport or it's individual activity or it's solitary and uh so i was reading a book recently talk about how um say mexican sport and how they why mexicans succeed in say taekwondo and not in say in the olympics and diving and the individual the individualistic culture and but i was thinking well if you know about martial arts you probably realize they're not really that individual in the sense that you've got to train with you've got a long-term relationship with the teacher or coach you've got to be with lots of people you probably have responsibility as a teacher in your as a black belt you probably teach beginners as well so it's like yes it's down in the competition it's one-on-one but in all the preparation it is shared so it's quite interesting how Mm. non-martial artists write about these things and see what we do yeah yeah self-help's an interesting Um, one of yeah yeah absolutely and so um in Part of coming back to your ongoing and future projects, so you are co-editing this forthcoming special issue on martial arts, health and society, mm-hmm. which is going to come out in Frontiers in Sociology. So can you just tell us a little bit about uh, what this special issue is hoping to achieve and what kind of submissions are you 
hoping to receive yeah, in that. Sure. Yeah, so though it's in frontiers in sociology, um, we've agreed that it's going to be in, interdisciplinary. So people from, say, psychology or anthropology, geography, history could also write so, uh, cultural studies as well. So we're anticipating, uh, we're, we're trying to get a collection, a eclectic collection of show the breadth of research we can look at. So it's very open ended, this theme of martial arts, health, and society. So it's looking at, it could be um, looking at martial arts therapies, even maybe self help. It could be looking at injuries and pain. All sorts of topics, really. That that we, we we gave a list of topics that have already been established. So pain, injury, for example, as we talked about earlier in ethnographic research on MMA and boxing, and that's a big theme. Uh, it, it could continue that theme, but it could also look at maybe how people are, or perhaps you know injured are actually part of a community. So we could look at the flip side of that and look at things that haven't been discussed before. And it could be um, physical therapies, or it could be more um, cognitive therapies, or it could be martial arts blended with mindfulness, for example, or, or blended with other sports. So we're looking at really open-ended theme because martial arts and health, yeah, it's been going on for years, but we'd hope to have a, a collection where people who have written about it can come, but also new scholars can come as well. And mm. I came because I've, I've been interested in health for um, quite a few years. Really. I've written about it, well, since 2014, 2014, 2015, in relation to the Chinese martial arts and the narratives and, and uh, philosophies of health. Uh, and I think, yeah, overall, it's an area which is quite rich and, and open to exploration. Because I think people are starting to become more interested in it. Um, there's been this book last year was published on martial arts and well-being um, by Carol Lloyd and Vicky, sorry, Carol Fuller and Vicky Lloyd. And they, uh, well, she, Carol Fuller's agreed to be involved as well. And her book's going to be reviewed for the special issue. So now there are books, now there are special issues. Now that it's, it's, it's an area that's starting to emerge in martial arts research, bringing the sciences hmm. with social sciences together. Uh, hmm. Yeah. So that yeah, would, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and all of us who might want to submit our paper, when when is the deadline? Mm. So it's a little bit. I'll try to keep it flexible. Um, officially, it's August the twenty fourth. Um, mm -hmm. We can add, add another two weeks because of the COVID, but we, we can be flexible because it's obviously I'm telling you now, <laughs> and it's in July. So I'm sure in September, October, maybe doable because it's an online journal. So it's not like we have to have everything in print by a certain date. If things come in or a review is a bit late or something goes on. Then I'm sure, mm. it, but hopefully everything will be on, you know, done and dusted by Christmas, or it will be published probably in January, February next year, online. All but things will emerge. So someone might publish something soon. So next month the first thing might be online, but then a few months later, the second one might come on. So it's it's very emergent. Um, yeah, yeah, it's that way. Hmm. Wonderful. So yeah. so I I really encourage all the listeners who are working in the area of martial arts studies to check it out and and if if your work fits the scope then then go ahead i'm sure george will be happy to receive your paper yeah. am Ooh, i right yeah. <laughs> you know i don't think your work would be very fitting and, uh, yeah and your colleagues wonderful yeah. mm. so um we will start wrapping up up mm -hmm. soon so um is there something else that i didn't ask you or something that you'd like to bring into this discussion i think i forgot to mention when you had a kind of a pre-ramble about the a network I'm, I'm trying to develop um, based on the event I organized at my university. So I organized an, a, an event called Martial Arts and Healthy Communities, which again feeds into this special issue because some of the contributors are, are going to write there. But I wanted to develop a, a network that connects the Martial Arts Studies Network and the other ones around the world, um, but is geared more towards the practitioner end of the practitioner researcher. Um, mm -hmm. because that inspired I remember we were going to a martial arts studies conference we had a dinner afterwards and I was sitting on a table of four and there's one guy opposite who was like has done martial arts like kendo and things but really he's more of a scholar and he and he, I asked him are you training he said oh, not, not at the moment because I'm going to crazy writing mode I was like okay <laughs> and it's me after I try to write quite a lot as well so I'm probably more of a researcher these days than I am a practitioner so a bit more critical a bit more kind of distant to it and then the other two on my left were like very much a practitioner teacher who blogs and the other one who's doing a PhD in martial arts, but you know, he works part-time as a, as an instructor and he's got, you know, almost what's potentially could be professional. So I was thinking more of the lines of those two. They were a bit more practitioner wanted more practical aspects of health pedagogy in the pragmatics of martial arts. Then that that's kind of a, a network I'm slowly trying to develop. And I had um, some, cause I wrote an article in, um, a magazine for the Tai Chi Union of Great Britain. And some people uh -huh. wrote back to me, so oh, I'd like to join. So I've got a few instructors who want to join and have events. And I feel obliged to organize an event. And it's important to do so. 
But I think, well, actually, with COVID and, and now with the online, I think, well, why not I create the free online events? You don't have to worry about traveling to Cardiff or another place. Don't need to worry about paying f- expensive fees to help profits margins of my university, all these things. It could be you know, mm-hmm. open and international. So uh, that's what I'm trying to develop. So if anyone wants to get in touch and help me do that, because again, I, I'm not, do you know, I'll be honest with you, I'm not capable of doing it all on my own. <laughs> I'm not a, uh-huh. a entrepreneur. So you know, it'd like, be great to have someone who's a specialist in technology, a specialist in logistics or whatever, and yeah, collaborate. And, this, and again, it works with all the other networks that have a more specialism in different areas. Because some of the network, martial arts studies, perhaps we didn't also discuss is, is a growing field. Um, it's it's been coined recently in, in the English language, but we could argue that it's had decades of development. But it's now it has um, ongoing projects that have long have long term effects, rather than perhaps in the early days in martial arts, seventies and eighties, nineties. The people wrote one or two papers, and for some reason they stopped writing about that topic. Maybe they found it uh-huh. hard to publish, or there wasn't space for them to do so. But now we have specialist journals, we have conferences, we have uh, established figures. So. Yeah, I'm still contributing to different networks, but I also build a network for that kind of missing link of people who go to these conferences but seem a bit, a little lost when it comes to the the big words and the kind of academic discourse and they want to make things that they can use and exchange practical ideas. Mm. So that's what I'm trying to develop, really. So that's wonderful. Uh, and you would you would appreciate the help from all of us who are interested in that? Yeah, yeah. So. Anyone could join and get on the list and we're... we're We can organize an online event, a discussion about particular topics, maybe a webinar, maybe short presentations, demonstrations. And um, yeah, that would be done. I mean, I hope to do one mm. hopefully by the end of the year Wonderful. or next uh, beginning of next year. So you're welcome, Nora, if you want to help me organize one. Your your experience in yeah. podcasting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That could be one thing we can do together. Yeah, definitely. Wonderful. Nice. So it's it's really been interesting and and i'm sure that people the listeners today like whether you're doing martial arts or not uh these messages about how how we can adapt to to the lockdowns how we can actually learn new things and how we can keep up practicing our our sport exercise physical activity whatever it is i'm i'm really hoping that uh anyone can take a few things uh with us from today so What would be your final remarks to to close our our episode? Okay, well, I think that this um, period, in regards to chaos, I mean, <laughs> funny enough, one of the films we watched with my hemo group was Jurassic Park, <laughs> which I hadn't seen since a kid. So watching it again as an adult, there was um, Jeff Goldblum. He plays a mathematician who's an expert in chaos theory. <laughs> so I might have to look up this chaos theory if I understand, if I can understand it. And it helped me understand that you know, in chaos, chaos is always a part of nature. So we we have chaos in In disease, we have chaos in the economy. We have chaos, and I think the chaos within chaos, we can be creative, and that's kind of the message I found has been reinforced from this this training. And I find that yeah, don't worry too much about chaos because amazing things can come out of chaos. Really, new martial arts can be created, uh, new therapies, new systems, new networks, new events. So yeah, I think that don't you know be be enlightened. Don't be too disheartened by this. Hopefully you're still keeping mm-hmm. active and you can do things with your running club or your triathlon club, whatever you're doing. Um, but don't do it alone. You need people. You need a network of people to, to to enable that. So hopefully that you can learn, take lessons from these martial arts groups and things. I'm, you know, these case studies, not from necessarily from me, but from the people I'm learning from. And and then hopefully that's their, their stories have been inspiring for you. Hopefully. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, we we very much look forward to reading your research when you have written it up and when, yeah. when we can see it in the published form yes so you're here. yeah so thank you george it was really a pleasure to have you as a guest well, thank you and like i said already i think the work you do is very timely and and it can help us all think about how we are adapting uh, to the changing world thank and you. so i very much appreciate your time well, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me and thanks to you and ollie for for, do, for conducting this and thanks to the listeners really i hope you've I know martial arts is not always saying in Britain, not everyone's cup of tea, but hopefully there's been some transferable ideas from whatever physical activity, sport or exercise you're interested in. Hopefully the those ideas will, will, will transfer. So. Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Research Through Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. 
If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcast or whichever app you use. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show. It would be a great help for us. We have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes, so be sure to tune in. Thank you all for your support and have a great day.